Okay, welcome back. Um, we have been talking about transmission lines, waves in a, and I call that waves in a long, thin circuit. And really what, I'm, what, I, what, what, what we're going to be thinking about is, uh, in fact, um, what happens when we have a relatively high, high frequency signal, 10 to 100 megahertz, gigahertz, that kind of number. And I go down a coaxial cable and I go some appreciable distance, several, many, many wavelengths, say 10 or more wavelengths down that, that signal. And so I have a, a transmission unit, that's the function generator. And then I've got the, let's say a coax, twisted pair or something like that, transmission line. And then I have, I dump it out into some sort of receiver, okay? And the reason I'm using TX and RX is, uh, is that, that, you know, this is a COMSYS. This is a, the example here is a communications link. But it could also be a feed into an antenna. Or even these days with higher and higher frequencies, the movement of, of data from one chip on a board to another chip on a board. Okay. The important thing that makes it a transmission line is that I have some sort of wavelength associated with my highest frequency. And that wavelength is, is smaller than the distance from transmitter to receiver, from one piece to another. And what that means is even though these are wires, the voltage doesn't equilibrate on the wire because it doesn't have time. You know, you're, moving, you're moving current around to equilibrate the voltage, and you're changing your mind faster than the current sees the, uh, that change. Okay. It takes some time, another way to say it is if it make a change at the transmission line, it takes some time, some number of nanoseconds, a foot for every nanoseconds, to, to, for that change to register downstream on the transmission line. Okay? So that it's that propagation delay, it's the wavelength size relative to the circuit that all say that, that it's, um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not, in a perfect circuit theory world. So a really cool little trick, and, and, and again, we could, we, could, we could do this in an electromagnetics perspective, uh, but I think it's, it's more general and very, and, and very powerful to think about it from a, from a lump circuit element model. So we go back to circuit theory and we tie, this is sort of a bridge between you know, true electromagnetics and circuit theory, we say, let me consider a very small element of this transmission line. And if I consider it small enough, then the, the movement, the time from one side of that to the other is virtually instantaneous. That, that little element, maybe the whole line can't catch up with the changes of the signal, but across this one little piece, this little delta Z, DZ of this piece, I can. And so I create... For that DZ, I cr create a lump circuit element uh, that comprises a, um, an inductance and a capacitance. Okay? And the inductance is in line with the current flow, and the capacitance is across one wire to the second wire. Okay? And you could call it a feed versus a return, but things get mixed up pretty fast on that, you know. Okay, so so this and and we also saw last time that there'll be additional loss terms, metal resistive losses and loss terms in the in the dielectric, and we'll we'll treat that more formally as as our second or third example here, but the most crucial elements is that the is a, is an inductance in the wire and a capacitance across the wires, and so in a length DZ, sorry. In a length element DZ, a tiny little sliver of this transmission line, I have a small little inductance and I have a small little capacitance. I have a, I have a current flowing in and a current flowing out, and that, can, that creates a bit of a headache on a minus sign if you're trying to, to relate this to other two-port theorems. And then a voltage on the input, a voltage on the output. And we calculated, we, we, what our principal result last time were these telegraphers' equations. Okay, that tells you what century we're in. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is, in, fa this is in fact the, um, the, uh, the equations of motion for, these, for this transmission line. And, and what I want to call your attention to is I've got a voltage with respect to space, a change in the voltage with respect to space, 
in here, a change in the voltage with respect to time in the second equation, a change in the current with respect to time in the first one, and a change in the current with respect to space in the second one. So volts, amps, amps, volts, mitigated by the inductance and the capacitance. Okay? Two coupled, first order, partial differential equations, so far, well, with, with coefficients, we're tacitly assuming these coefficients to be constant, okay, with respect to space or with respect to, to, um, to, to voltage. But if you look at our derivation, it's a very terse derivation. And one of the real powers of these, of these equations is that they can be generalized so lovely, so wonderfully, to include things that are non, that, that where L and C might change slowly as a function of Z. Or if you want to put lumped, lumped um, active elements in there, you can bring those into the fold, including their nonlinearities. Okay, so if you have a small circuit, if you have a small, a small signal circuit model of a transistor, or an amplifier, and you periodically line that with this line with it, you can come up with a closed form expression, probably, for that under a lot of under a lot of circumstances. So this is this formalism or this this approach. It's not, it's so simple, but it's so powerful, because as soon as you recognize that you can you can you can discretize things, you can make those unit cells to be really quite complicated. And your macroscopic equations, your equations for the macroscopic flow of, across Z and across T for I and V can then have things that are quite interesting in there, in them, okay? So, so that's, that's, um, that's just sort of a little bit of a cheerleading uh, point to these equations. They don't have to be, they, they look fairly trivial they're fun. We're gonna have, we'll have a good time with them. Don't worry. But they, but they also open the door to a lot more complicated and a lot more interesting problems as well. Okay. Now, one of the things that we also did last time was was I walked you through these L and these Cs, the inductance per length and the capacitance per length, and and I wanted and and, and we spent a lot of time on the coax cable. I mean, I think I got you, I think you were probably sound asleep by the time I, I finished that up. And just to, so just to wake you up again and to remind you of this, this is, this is like a coax cable. It's like a BNC cable or an SMA cable. It's got a center conductor, a little small center pin, and it's got an external braid of wire around it with a dielectric in between it. I won't, I won't go a lot through here, but here's your inductance and capacitance. Notice that it's driven by the material. The inductance is driven by the material, epsilon, uh, mu, and C is driven by the material, epsilon. Okay, this is the same epsilon R times epsilon naught that we've been looking at before. And then, and then it's also driven by a geometry factor. So I have the ln of B over A over 2 pi and a 2 pi over the ln of B over A for that one, okay? So notice that, the, that the, um, the, the geometry factor is reciprocal between C and, and L. It's kind of interesting, I think. And that has some interesting ramifications for, for, and we'll, for what we'll see later on. Okay? We're going to come up with a speed of propagation, and we're going to come up with an impedance of the line, and, that's going to, and, and, and the placement of the geometry is going to matter in that. Okay? Um, Okay, and then, and then also here's the resistive losses and a lossy dielectric that we sort of went over last time. So I want to give you a couple more examples here. Two parallel wires. This is not a very good configuration. Usually you twist them to cancel out the EMI between, between them. You have one loop in a positive direction, one loop in the negative direction, positive, negative, so they cancel. But if I have two parallel wires, um, let's see, there isn't a good example of that. Um, you, the antenna for your hi-fi set or for an old television set 
um, there's a there's a there's a usually it's a brown plastic wire with two buried wires in there. Have have most of you seen that? So the feed to the antenna off of a hi-fi is a strip of brown wire that comes out and then it then it separates out, and so the feed for the antennas is very often two parallel wires, but just just like this. And in this in this particular example, these are circular cross sections. I have an A and a. Uh, I've chosen them to be both the same size. Formulas exist for all the permutations in the world, as you can imagine, on this. Um, in fact, some of you guys who, who are really who've done a lot of this RF stuff, you know, in industry in particular, if you've got a really good source, you know, like like 40 or 50 geometry com geometrical configurations, I'd love to see those. I'd have to go. I always have to go hunt around for you know. Anyway, um, so here's my here's here's this. It's two two separated by distance d. The inductance per length, the material of what's inside of there. And then I have a geometry factor, and it's the hyperbolic cosine of d over 2a, and then there's a pi in there. Interestingly enough, there's a, you know, pi slither into their problems anywhere they can get there. And then, uh, and then the capacitance per length is, has the dielectric constant of the material, and it has, geome it has a geometric factor where the pi is in the numerator and the cosh, inverse cosh is in the denominator. Okay, and if you take a second to look at the um, imp the the, uh, the impedance, the, uh, the loss term R S over two over pi a, you can see where that comes from in terms of the surface resisti resistivity, and then and then similarly for the lossy dielectric, um, that's also there. So the same the same geometric factor in the numerator for L, denominator for C, comes up again. That's true of the of all these formulas. Another example, and again, there are a million variations of geometry here, and I've picked a very trivial one, just two parallel plates, two parallel lines. This might happen a lot on a circuit board, a printed circuit board. There you'd be tempted to make one or more of a ground plane, or you'd be able to be tempted to sandwich the, the, one, of the free, one of them between two ground planes. Those are all variations on this. But this one's nice because it looks like a parallel plate capacitor. And so I can draw your attention to, for example, the capacitance epsilon W over D. Remember, for a parallel plate capacitor, it's epsilon A over D. But we're doing capacitances and inductances per length. So the area per length is just W. So this, this here is exactly epsilon A over D, except for per length, it's the width of the, of the, of the line. And the inductance, again, has the D over W instead of W over D. So flipped relationship for the geometrical factor, the shape factor. Okay. I think I muttered last time something to the effect that m almost all engineering problems are picking the material and picking what shape to make that material into. Right. And, and that's what, it's at, the, at some base level, that's all these, these, these formulas are. Right. Okay, and then there's a variety of other, you know, um, type popular types of transmission lines, and uh, you know. Okay. All right. So, what we'll do tonight is we'll pick up uh, we'll pick up these equations here. And we'll, we'll come up with a solution for them, okay? So the first thing we'll do is we'll take this equation here. Oh, let, 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 me, let me just go back for one second. Remember when we were doing wave equations for deriving wave equations from Maxwell's equations? There we had a first derivative term in space and a first derivative term in time, coupled sets of equations. Those were the curl equations. And in order to get moved to a second derivative in space and a second derivative in time, we took another derivative with respect to space. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. We're going to take this equation here, and we're going to take a, the, 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 the space derivative with respect to both sides of that, of that equation there. Okay? So del V del Z is equal to minus L del I 
del t. And what I'll do is I will take d by dz of both sides. Okay. If I can pull L through z, if L is not a function of z, Oh, thank you. Sorry. Then I have a, a minus L, minus 1 over L, d2 v dz squared. This left-hand term looks really nice. The right-hand term is a, is a second derivative of current, but it's mixed. Not really very pretty. So now if I take del i, del t, hang on, let me, I think I have that wrong, del i, del z, sorry, if I have a del i, del z is equal to minus c, del v, del t, then if I do a d by dt of both sides, And if C doesn't change with respect to time, then I have that mixed derivative, the del 2i del z del t on the left hand side and I have a minus C del V del T on the, on, on the right hand side. And you'll notice that this guy and this guy are the same. And so I have minus 1 over L D2 V DZ squared is equal to minus C d2 v dz d, dt squared. Okay. And so I can put these guys together into a del 2 v del z squared and that's equal to L times C times del 2 v del t squared. And that's, so that's a nice clean wave equation, right? Second derivative of the voltage with respect to space. Second derivative of the voltage with respect to time. And these are constant coefficients. Now, again, this is V in volts per meter squared. And this is V in volts per time squared. So the role of this constant has to move us from a per time to a per meter squared. So this guy here is 1 over the velocity squared. I'm trying to be good about my Vs. These are big capital Vs and that's a little velocity V. Okay. So V is equal to 1 over the square root of LC. And do you remember how I blathered on and on and on and on and on about the geometry factors? One was in the numerator, one was in the denominator. Do you remember that? I went on ad nauseum. If I go back... to the coax equation, for example, I have L, I have the ln of B over A over 2 pi, 
and I have C, 2 pi epsilon over ln of B over A. I'm I'm now want to, to get my speed of propagation, I'm going to multiply L and C together. What happens to the log? Go away. And what happens to the 2 pi? Go away. What's left? Mu and epsilon. Does that look at all familiar to you? That's the same speed of light in the material that we had for, for Maxwell's equations. Why? Why doesn't geometry matter there? <coughs> Subtle. Cause, yes? Because there's the upper limit, C? Yeah. That's true, that's true, but we are at that upper limit, C. <laughs> we're, not, we're not degraded by a geometry factor, right? So that's kind of interesting. Well, it turns out, uh, it's actually a very, it's actually a very um, uh, subtle relationship between the V and the I and the electromagnetic side of the house. And so what happens is there, we are going to trace, information moves from the transmitter to the receiver. And what we're tracing in our, in our mathematics is what's happening to the voltage and the current on the boundaries of this transmission line. Okay? Inside the transmission line, inside that, that, that little white dielectric annulus, that's where the electromagnetics lives. That's where the E field and the H field lives. And so, Inside the, inside the coax cable or in between the parallel plates, there is, a, there is an electromagnetic wave and it's moving through that material and so that's where the material speed of light comes from. Okay? And so because that wave is moving through there, the voltage and the current also move, are tugged along, the boundary conditions are tugged along with electromagnetics. Okay? Or you can say that the V and the I give rise to the electric field inside and, they and, the, and, that, and that tugs the field along, okay? They're both the same, you know. So, so if you have some fun with people, if they start arguing it one way, you can argue with the other and then if, they flip, if you convince them, then you can go back and argue their side because it's really it's the same thing, okay? So yeah, so it's, it's very, very, very interesting. But, but, but it's also not necessarily obvious because if I go back to my parallel plates, okay, they're separated, right, which means I can have a voltage difference from one plate to another, okay, and that's, and that's, and that's, that's a very vital part of this, of this particular formula. Later on, if we have time, I'll box this parallel plate in, which means that at any instant, the voltage along, all the way around that has to be the same. It can't be different from the top plate to the bottom plate because they're all grounded and they're all connected. And what that'll do is that'll take the wave, in this case, it's a plane wave, and it'll twist it back. It'll cock it back. And so instead of propagating perpendicular to the plates, it'll bounce up and down, up and down, up and down from one reflector to another reflector, from one from the top plate to the bottom plate. And it'll bounce at an angle, which means the time of flight is no longer the length of the transmission line, it's the length of the transmission line multiplied by the triangle, the accordion structure, right? I mean, think about it. If you walked straight down the, this aisle, you'd get to from A to B pretty fast, but if you zigzagged, it would take you many, many more steps and much longer to get from front of the room to the back of the room. And that's what's going on between the, when I, when I change these boundary conditions subtly. And in that case, the geometry the, does have, will have an impact on it. But in, this, in these cases, we talked about TM and TE. These are TEM, transverse electromagnetic waves. So both T, they're both TE and TM together, so we call them TEM waves. And that's the mark of a, of a uh, this is, sorry, 
this here is 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 the mark of the of the material of the of the of that TEM propagation. Okay. So interesting result. We now see we now see even a, even a more of a parallel between the electromagnetics and, and this particular wave equation. Okay. I do think it's really interesting. Um, I do think it's really interesting that that um, the uh, uh, the signals in these wires move at the speed of light. You know that 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 tells you that tells you really when you throw the switch how long it takes the room to fill up with light because it's approximately it's pretty close to the speed of light in the wires. There's some uh, there's some lighting of the of the of the of the of the lamp and that's long 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 time to any of the electronics, and then it takes nanoseconds per foot, a foot a nanosecond to fill the room with light. You know, so it kind of gives you that sense of what happens when you walk into a dark room and throw the switch, the time scales of that. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Oh, I, I know exactly what, I'm sorry. Got off track a little bit. We've solved this wave equation a million times, right? We solved this wave equation a million times. Uh, we Fourier transformed it. We've substituted in all all, the, all those different ways. So I'm going to solve it again, but I want to solve it in a, in a different way, because let's face it, even I don't like to repeat too many times. Okay. So let me let me let me solve this in a different way. And I'm, going to, I'm going to mess up. Your, your life a little bit by changing notations just a little bit. So I have some disturbance U, change in X, change in T, speed of propagation. It's really the same, I just made U equal to V equal to u and then I've, I've explicitly wrote and written down what that is. Oh, and I changed x to z, but that's not a big deal. Okay. So these are, these are this, this is a very common mathematical representation of a, of a, of a transmission line or uh, sometimes, I don't know if you've seen this derivation, but a, a, a string that's been plucked, right? You, you solve for the displacement away and the tension in the line and watch the pulse move down the trend, but down the, down the, I guess the guitar string or the piano wire. So what I'd like to do is I want to look for solutions and you can convince yourself that this is not different from what we had before. Okay, so, so certainly U has to be a function of X and T. If you look back to your plane waves, they were functions of z and t, right? So that's not, that's not terribly different. But here's where things get really interesting. I'm going to show a solution that's dependent not on the shape of u, but on the coordinates, the, co the form of the coordinates, how the coordinates go together. X and T. Okay? So the other way, the, before when we saw these wave equations, we looked for wave-like wave solutions, right? Sines and cosines. E to the IKZ, E to the I omega T. Well, I, I don't want to make any assumption about, I don't want to make any assumption about sines and cosines. Okay? And one very big reason I don't want to do that is... The name of these equations are the telegraphers' equations. And the telegraphers don't send sines and cosines from, from train station to train station. They, sell, they send dots and dashes. And my transmission line had better work for any obituary notice that gets sent from train station to train station. 
Did you know that that was the real motivation behind Morse for solving, for coming up with the Morse code? He, he was very, a loved one passed away in New York and because of the long delay in getting the message to him, he missed the funeral by not much. But he, he, he thought to himself, why does it take so long to go from one place to another place? And so he teamed up with this other guy. His contribution was, his contribution was of course the coding, the, the efficient coding scheme. Some of you know what his profession was at the time. Do you know, and, and anyone know what, there wasn't a lot of engineering back then, right? It was just dawn of the industrial age, the industrial revolution. He was a painter. He was, he was, a, he was a portrait painter. That's how he made his money. You know, they didn't have cam the cameras were not quite yet there. So, you know, he made a pretty good living as an artist and his hobby was electrical engineering. I know a lot of you are electrical engineers by profession and play, a, play an instrument for a hobby or, or sketch or paint or something, what have you. The world's kind of turned on its head a little bit, hasn't it? All right, so, so what I'm claiming is, and this is, this is bizarre, whatever you is, whatever that you, the shape of you, triangle, sawtooth, a dot, a dash, a dash, dash, dot, a dot, dot, dash, as long as the movement down the line obeys x minus ct, then I'm, then I'm okay. And again, look, look at the role of c. This is units of meters, and ct will have meters per second times second. So I get to add apples to oranges, apples to apples. All right, now how do I do this? How do, I, how do I do this? Well, I've got to figure out how to take derivatives. I've got to figure out how to take a d by dx in eta. And I have to figure out how to take a d by dt in eta. So what I'll do is I'll go del u del x is equal to del u del eta del eta del x. That's the chain rule. Is that what I did? And so the operator, del by del x, appears to equal del by del eta, del eta, del x. I could simplify that a little bit, but I'm not going to quite yet. Because I, I think it's important to, for you, I think, I hope then it will be important for you someday to have a more general um, expression of this. So this is d by dx, but I need d2 by dx squared. So I have to do this again. So I have del 2u, del x squared, is equal to del by del x, del u, del eta, del eta, del x. So now I have a product. So I have to use the product rule. That's my first term, taking the derivative of my first term, leaving my second term alone. Then I'll leave my first term alone And there's my second term. So I keep going with this.
So this term here, for example, becomes del 2 eta del a x squared. This operates on that guy. And I can collect everything. And remember, I need a d by dt on it as well. And so if I just replace my x's with my t's, I get everywhere in here. But most importantly, in the last line, I get an expression for not only del 2u del x squared, but also del 2u del t squared. All right, now to calculate these guys, this is the most complicated way I can possibly do this, right? So let me, let's take a look at what I like about these guys. I like terms like d2 u d eta squared and d u d eta because what that's doing is that's changing my partial differential equation in x and t to my new variable eta, right? So, so this term here and this term here I expect as a variable transformation from, from, from my differential equation in x and t. So this, this guy and this guy, this guy and this guy, that's just natural. Now let's look at these coefficients because that's all they are. Del, del eta del x squared, del eta del t squared. Well, if I say, I guess I'll... I'll go to the next page and we'll come back. If I say eta is equal to x minus ct, then this is a function eta as a function of x and eta as a function of t. And I need, for example, a del eta del t. Well, I can take del eta del t That's equal to minus c. The equation wants a del eta del t squared. So I get a c squared from that. Okay. So at least in this term here, that's just a c squared term, the speed of light squared. Okay? Del 2 eta del t squared, well, I take derivative of this guy here, derivative of constant is zero. Everyone see that? If d a to dt is minus c, then the second derivative is zero. And if I go back to my equation there, that term goes away. That term is zero. So del 2 u del t squared is equal to c squared times del 2 u del eta squared plus a zero. Let's go back to the well here and I'll have del eta del x 
let's see, I need a del A to del X, don't I? Uh, yeah, del A to del X, this coefficient here. So del A to del X is equal to 1. Not hard. I need a del 2A to del X squared. And that's equal to 0. Derivative of 1 is 0. OK? So this formulation is very gentle with respect to all these derivatives. And so now I can write del 2u del z squared, or x squared, rather, is equal to 1 times del 2u del eta squared plus 0. So the first derivatives, del u del eta terms, go away to 0. So if I substitute this into the wave equation, del 2u del x squared is equal to del 2u del eta squared. 1 over c squared comes from the wave equation. And then I need to put in a del 2u del t squared. But a del 2u del t squared is going to equal c squared del 2u del eta squared. And that looks right. Looks like we have a solution. So any pulse that I send from my transmitter to my receive will move at the speed of light down this transmission line. So I don't have to worry about sines and cosines, right? If I have a simple wave equation like this, as long as, it, as, long as I see that it moves at the speed of light. Now think back to the e to the i omega t plus k, e to the i omega t minus kz. Okay. Remember the dispersion relation that relates omega to k. That we can rearrange that form exactly to have this z minus ct form in it. Okay. We can bury the we can divide through by the omega and the and 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 get an omega over a k over omega to get that c term in there. So the sine waves that we found, because of their arguments, it was a very special case of this traveling wave pulse form. Okay. Does everyone see that? If you go back to the e to the i k z, e to the i omega t, and rearrange those, you'll see that that's exactly the same form of a traveling wave as what we've had here, just moving around the, the material properties. But let me go one step further. If I, have a trend, if, I, if I set up my function generator, not for a sine wave, but for a triangle wave, right? Triangle waves will go down that, that coax cable really nicely, right? You don't expect anything to happen to them. So if I asked you, how do I express, how do I make the connection between e to the i omega t and a triangle wave, you'd say, well, I'll take the triangle wave and I'll write it as a Fourier series. And so a sum of all those sines and cosines will propagate down the transmission line in accordance with what we saw before, and they'll add up to the triangle wave. 
Okay? So remember when I said that the plane wave was just one term of a very rich possibility of Fourier series? Well, this is, a, this is another example of that. The reason, the reason that we have no contradiction is because I can write any waveform u as a sum of Fourier series, and in this horribly simple line, nothing bad happens. The, all the Fourier series just walk down the line, the transmission line at the speed of light. No distortion on your pulse at all. Lots of luck in real life. <laughs> but for slow frequencies, for modest shapes, perfectly fine. Okay? So that's a, it's a very simple, it's a solving the wave equation in a different way, cluttered with some mathematics, right? I mean, this is, I, I, I purposefully did this the most complicated way. And the reason I, just to be fair, just to be open about it, I'm inviting you to think about other harder wave equations with nonlinearities in them or dispersions in them or things like that. In which case, can you find a coordinate system, a traveling wave coordinate form that will still work in that transmission line? In which case, you need this, you need this kind of apparatus to be able to set that up. Okay? Um, but, yeah, so solving the wave equation in a completely different way unlocks a completely new interpretation of the plane wave and unlocks a completely new application from esoteric waves to real communication signals. Okay? And of course there's the connection between the two. Okay? So anyway, that's why that's why I wanted to that's why I wanted to do things very, very differently for you tonight. Okay? All right. Well, let's see where we are. We started with the telegrapher's equations. We converted them to a wave equation for the voltage. We solved this wave equation in general, but also for the voltage. And so we now have a solution for V as a function of Z and T. And this will equal V1. And I'll, I'll write it yet a different way. What's the difference between the minus and the plus? Direction of propagation. I want to use this transmission line to talk both ways, to have a, du a full duplex conversation instead of just transmitting one way. And I want to know what I is. Can't really have a full solution with just the voltage. And I'll substitute this into the telegrapher's equation. So now I'll integrate with respect to time. And I'll integrate up to some time, and I have to pick, a, I have to pick the lower limit carefully, so I won't. I'll just go way back to minus infinity, where I know this line hasn't even been built, and so therefore it's, it's quiet. There's no, there's no voltage on it. So we'll go back in time to make sure that the voltage in the line is zero. Now let's think a little bit on that too from a physical perspective, okay? I, 
am transmitting information, it takes time for that voltage signal to move from the transmission to the receiver. Okay? And it can stay in that line for a long time. Okay? And so if I start piling more voltage on top of it, I'll change the state of things. So I have to let the memory of the line, of the transmission line, die out until it, so that it's fresh and quiescent or zero. Okay? So, so this line actually, all these capacitors and inductors, these energy storage elements that comprise the whole length of the line, they're doing their job. They're storing the energy of the signals. Right? And so that's why, that's why, that's why we're, we're, pile, we're gonna, we, if, we, if we're not careful with that, we'll pile voltage on top of voltage, current on top of current. Okay? And then we may lose track of what our message signal is. All right, regardless. That, just a little bit of hypervigilance on, the, on, that, on that limits of integration, again, giving us some perspective. What this allows us to do is calculate an I as a function of Z and T. This is equal to 1 over L times the velocity of propagation times V1 T minus Z over V. There's a minus sign that comes in when I consider the integration with time versus, the integra versus what's going on with the minus signs in there. And this lower limit gives me a voltage distribution in Z. It's almost, it's not, that's my constant of integration with respect to time, but not necessarily with respect to space. This is current. V, the, the direction of the voltage wave traveling is indicated by these guys here. This minus sign indicates the direction of the current traveling. So the direction of the current, the voltage flow is given by this and this. The current flow is given by this, this, and this. Okay? Now, this guy here, I equals some number times voltage. Move this over, V equals IR. So I have the impedance of the line is equal to L times V. We've seen that before. That's the inductance per length times, the, times, the, times V. The V was equal to 1 over the square root of LC. So this is equal to the square root of L over C. Units of ohms. That's, in a, that's exactly the same as what we had for the impedance of a material that our plane wave was propagating in. Mu over epsilon. Again, an inductance per length over a capacitance per length. But these are the lump circuit elements. So not only do they have the potential, not only do they have the material in it, but it also has the geometry factor. Okay? Now remember the geometry factors were reciprocals of each, were, were, one was in the numerator, one was in the denominator. So now, now when I calculate my Z naught, and I'll do this for coax, I have, a, I, have, I have twice the material, the, sorry, twice the geometry factor. So 
So this guy here gives you a starting point for your, for your um, impedance of your line. If it's a hollow line, then it's, what is it, 377 ohms? So this is, that's sort of the maximum value. Okay? If you have a material in there, epsilon r is going to be greater than 1, and that'll drop it down. That'll drop that impedance down, due only to the material. And then this guy here, if you look at it, you know, you've got a 6 in the denominator, a little bit more than 6, 2 pi in the denominator. And then you've got a lawn of B over A, and you've got to ask yourself how much bigger should B be than A to overcome a factor of 6. You're not going to see that very often. So principally, this is, this is going to drive you, this is also going to drive down your, your impedance. What's a typical impedance line for a coax cable? 75 ohms is, is one. What's another one? 50 ohms. So now you see how you get from 377 ohms down to 50 ohms. You pick a material that you can work with with some precision and not a lot of cost and not a lot of loss. And then you futz with the shape and in particular the size of things to get you into a standard that some people, that people like to use. 75 ohm, 50 ohm. 75 ohm for cable, 50 ohms for coax, things of that nature. Okay, so that, that's there's no that, there's no real mystery or magic where this 50 ohm comes from, or 75 ohm. There is a I think there is a magic for the 377 ohms, but that's just me. But that's where all that stuff's coming from. So the lumped impedances, they don't have, the geometry doesn't have any effect on the speed, but it does have an effect on the impedance of the line. Okay. Okay. So, we solved the differential equation. We should spend a second to look at boundary conditions. Wow. Okay, sorry. And what I mean by that is terminating a transmission line. So with this concept of the impedance, our life becomes pretty easy. Because what I'm looking at here is a line into a load and for now, we'll just have a nice lossy resistive load. And the impedance of the line is Z0, as we found. And remember, in the spirit of this lumped circuit line, this, is, this ending here is a tiny sliver. Of, a, of, a, of the transmission line. So circuit theory should hold right across this termination. So I can do Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law. There'll be a wave that's moving in the plus Z direction plus a wave that's moving in the minus Z direction. And that will have to equal the voltage across the load. And this is just KVL, and I'll call this equation one. And then do KCL, Kirchhoff's current law, equation two, conservation of charge or current. The sum of the current in that load, the sum of the current here, must be equal to the current that goes through the load. Uh, 
I know that my current is related to my voltage through the impedance, right? So I can rewrite 2 as V plus over Z naught, that's this term here, plus V minus over Z naught, oops, I'm sorry, should be a minus sign from that guy there. And that's going to equal VL, but divided by not the impedance of the line, but rather the impedance of the load. So I can rearrange this. V plus minus V minus will equal Z naught over RL times VL. But there's another way of writing VL. from equation number one. So I'll get V plus minus V minus will equal Z naught upon RL times V plus plus V minus. Try not to be too sloppy here. But I'll divide through by V plus. The reason I'm doing that is I'm referencing it to the, to the wave that comes into the load. Okay? So I'll normalize with respect to the incident voltage. Just like we did when we were bouncing plane waves off of a, off of a surface. So, Now I'll bring all the factors that don't have the V plus, V minus over V plus on one side, and I'll catch all the V minus over V plus on the other side, and And now I'll solve for the ratio of V minus over V plus. That's the amount of the voltage that comes back at you. Normalize the amount of voltage that you launch there. And we called that the field reflection coefficient before. Seems to be good enough to call it that now. And I'll just go ahead and put it into a form that we've seen before. So the field reflection coefficient, exactly how we had before, 
is the difference between the impedances divided by the sum of the two impedances. And that's ridiculously easy to generalize. I did it for a loss for a resistor, but it doesn't have to be that way. Okay. So we've this we've seen this before. No new information, but it's comforting. It's comforting to see it. It's a nice review of what we had before. Well, there's a um, fraction of voltage that's reflected, but there's also a fraction of the voltage that's dropped across the load, right? So what we'd also like is V load divided by V plus. And I think we called this tau last time, right? the transmission coefficient. Let's see. So if we go back to this equation here, if we go back to this equation here, we can um, have that. And now if I divide through by V plus, I have that. This guy here is our, our row. And this guy here is what we want for tau. So VL over V plus is going to equal RL over Z naught, multiply and divide, times 1 minus rho. cleaning things up. We're actually making things messier. Substitute in for rho. Put this on a common denominator. So I have RL plus C naught minus RL plus C naught. gets me to tau twice RL over RL plus Z naught. And again, if you look, if you look back at, at the ADAs that we did for dielectric, you'll see exactly that form, formulation. Okay? So this, this gives you another interpretation of what we had before. Okay, so... So I want, to, I want to look at this equation a little bit more. The reflection is equal to the difference between the impedances over the sum of the impedances. And supposing I have the load resistance equal to zero, what I mean by that is my transmission line comes in and the resistance is negligible. Well, that's a short. That's taking a, taking a that's soldering together the center pin to the sleeve. Okay. So if I 
L is equal to zero, that means that rho is equal to minus one. And that means that my signal goes goes this this rise and fall goes through the through the short circuit. It flips polarity, but it comes right back at the source. Okay. RL equal to infinity means that I connect my, my wire, my lead, my type N connector, and I don't do anything to the other end before I turn on my network analyzer, my very expensive network analyzer. And so the voltage here for RL equal to infinity, this gets big, I neglect Z naught, this gets big, I neglect C naught, and then I divide them back out. So I get rho is equal to positive one. So my pulse going this way turns around and comes right back at my very expensive network analyzer which is a good way to burn out the front end of your network analyzer. I think you've, if you've been in the RF lab, they've probably nagged you about that, right? Always terminate your lines. And not with a short circuit, by the way. Okay? There's a third case. That's RL equal to Z naught. And at that case, rho will equal zero. And tau will equal one. And so that's your optimal coupling. All your power gets dumped into the load <coughs> with no reflection back. And that only happens at one impedance. Okay.